Hey guys, how's it going? Anthony Mutraja here, back with a new video lesson for y'all. First of all, I am extremely sorry for the clickbait title, but I'm really trying to get the attention of guitar players with this lesson. Fusion guitar players. All right. How do we play like Alan Holdsworth? Well, the answer is it's impossible because whatever he played, whatever he wrote, whatever he did is just extremely unique to him. And no matter what you do after transcribing his lines, you're just going to sound like a bad clone. And that led me to put the second bit to the title, imitation versus inspiration. Okay, so I'm not going to break down any lick or phrase that he's played in the past on live recordings or um, albums. I'm just going to talk about five simple things which I heard a lot in his music and it's something that has influenced me a lot without me even realizing it. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is this actual overdrive sound. Now, um, I've heard many videos where it almost sounds like Dimebag Daryl trying to play Holdsworth lines. Not that I don't like Dimebag, I love Dimebag, but that sound isn't right. When it comes to the overdrive and the gain on the overdrive, you need to find a middle ground where you can sustain a note and also move that sustained note without losing too much momentum. I'm using the overdrive on my Zoom multi effects for bass, so it's not the greatest, but I found that practicing with this sound has really helped me focus the way I play in this context with this kind of a guitar sound. All right, so what I do is generally I put the gain in the middle at about five, and the volume on my guitar is at about 60%. I don't max it out. The, th the truth is if you max it out, it's gonna be extremely hard to control because there'll be too much um, um, overtones that way. And my, my tone knob is at about 60%. So the tone and volume are both at 60%. The gain on the overdrive is at about um, 12 o'clock or at five. And um, I find that this helps me project my ideas better along the vibes of Holdsworth. Okay, and now with regards to the reverb and delay that I use, what I tend to do is I use a lot of um, room size on the, on the reverb. I put more pre-delay, but the wetness in proportion to the dry sound is uh, pretty much like this. So this is the dry signal, which is almost maxed out. And the wet signal is about 20% in comparison to the uh, dry signal. So I do this with reverb and delay, even if I'm playing clean or on my bass, if I uh, want to add some reverb and delay, this is how I use it. You just want the delay to carry the tail end of the note a little longer than when it's actually done playing. Okay, so that's the sound aspect of it. The second thing I want to talk about is his note choices. Okay, now in jazz, it's very common to study chords and chord scales. And Holdsworth actually has an instruction video where he's talking about chords and chord scales. But if you actually pay attention closely, I'm sure he came up with that or somebody helped him come up with that. Not claiming to know that that's what happened. But because Holdsworth's playing is extremely coming from a place of theory that is pure street. It is not um, academically um, correct, but he went with what he liked as far as he was concerned with sound. So, for example, if you have a B minor seven flat five in the key of C, we naturally think Locrian or Locrian, what's that? Locrian natural two, one of the modes of the melodic minor. But Holdsworth never thought modes, never uh, talked modes. And you actually hear it in his playing that there was not really modal thought process. It was more of a universal um, bag of sounds. So if you're in the key of C major and there's a B minus and flat five, to him it was just this one sound going into the C major or going down to the A minor. He didn't isolate it and say, okay, I'm going to play this on that. He looked at it as, okay, it belongs to the same family. So I just want to quickly show you guys what I mean. So if I am, um, let's say I'm going to play something in the tonality of D major. 
I will use certain notes that don't um, diatonically belong to the scale, but you will hear the tendency of it trying to lean towards the D major. Okay, there was nothing Holdsworth about what I played. I've actually never transcribed any of his lines, but you can hear where I am implying different harmonies, but I'm still centering around the D major. So that is something we don't put ourselves through as far as thought process goes or even the practice goes because we are confined to thinking C major, we can play C Lydian or C Ionian. D minor, I can play D Dorian, melodic minor, Aeolian. And what starts to happen is that you become a great chord scale technician, but that doesn't enable you to create actual melodies. So if I'm thinking a C major sound, for example, So I'm accessing every and any note in the scale and if I hear something going a little out of it, I'm still centering around the C major tonality because that's like home for me. So that's why in his music it's very hard to actually find a key center as opposed to like standards or uh, many other compositions out there. So that is no choices. The next thing I want to talk about is... Um, how he connects ideas. Now in bebop we have target tones and enclosures but Holdsworth while he kind of had that sound he didn't really have it at the same time. So if I take say a simple progression like um, C minor 7 to C major 7 So from C minor 7 Okay, and the looseness and the rhythm of how he played is also another great thing to study. He took his time spelling out the idea and really honing in on the idea of creating melodies. So C minor F minor, B minor, 9, G minor, G minor 9 to E flat major 7, back to G minor, E flat major, E flat minor, Minor. 
right? So one thing you can actually do is write out any chord progression you like to whatever, don't have a system to just write out at random, 16 bars for example, and then try to sit and create melodies over it. So what you'll notice is that when you start to bridge changes in that manner, the target tone concept, the enclosure concept, the whole bebop or jazz school becomes a little irrelevant. So you start to get into a different territory of vocabulary where you're just creating melodies as you go in relevance to the changes. Of course, you can uh, do this systematically, you know, take progressions in a certain manner or you can do it um, in many other ways. But what I would suggest is just sit down, take a progression and just write it out. And um, try to come up with ideas okay and try to really focus your sound and um, every note should be accounted for okay the next thing I want to talk about the last thing I want to talk about actually is something that might get me a bunch of haters but I don't know how many times I've said this but legato is not a technique it's not a guitar technique where your left hand or fretting hand is flapping around legato is a projection of melodies without an actual space between the notes so in theory that's actually a legato phrase even though I'm using a lot more of my right hand because the idea is you don't want that is not legato that is legato it's smooth carried away I just love sitting down and doing this for hours but legato is projection of the melodies with n almost no space between the notes so you could alternate pick and still have a legato sound but in order to do that you need to have a very light touch you don't want to be um, doing this <laughs> Right? And you don't want to get stuck with these patterns of three notes per string. Although they are great, but you'll get stuck and you'll become a great three, three note per string technician. What you want to do is search for melodies. We open up the note choices, search for melodies, try to connect them in a meaningful manner and try to have a smooth sound to that. So, in other words, legato doesn't exclusively mean just no, you need the right hand. You need that picking hand once in a while. In my opinion, at least once every three notes. Sometimes it varies. Sometimes I don't pick at all. Sometimes I just keep my pick here just to quiet down the notes so I don't have to put a little fret wrap here because I don't like that. All right, so no choices. Explore everything, open ear and open mind. Your sound, be sure that you can control it because the more gain you add to your overdrive, the harder it gets to control and you lose dynamic momentum to the sound. Okay? Connecting your ideas, write out progressions, think the progression and play a melody based on the progression as well. And last but not the least, legato is a projection of sound. It's not technique. Yes, it requires technique, but the nature of the sound requires the technique. It is not you developing a technique to get that sound because that sound has existed for centuries. So I'm sorry to burst your bubble fellas, but legato is sound. Okay. So that's it for this lesson. If you guys um, would like more guitar lessons from me, do let me know uh, and I will do my best to post more lessons to my best ability. All right. This is pretty long. I'm sorry about that, but I hope you make it all the way to the end. Anyways, until the next one, I'll see you guys in the shed, alright? Peace.